Hey everyone, my name is Abby, and on behalf of our entire Wilkinson Church of Christ family, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in to this week's online message. Today, our discipleship minister, Brandon Grubbs, will be leading us into our message where we are wrapping up our current series, Unstoppable. Brandon will be focusing on how we become an unstoppable church as we remain in the book of Acts. We hope you enjoy the message. Continuing on with our Unstoppable series. So if you have your Bible or your phone or iPad or whatever it is, I encourage you to just go ahead and turn there to Acts 6. And I'm actually going to read the very last part of Acts 5 before we get there, because I think it's important uh, that we get just a little bit of context of what's going on before we get there. If you don't have a Bible or a phone, um, you're going to be able to read most of the text up here on the screen. So let me first just give you a little bit of background, what's going on in this series and what's been going on in Acts so far because before we get to chapter six which there's there's this big issue that tends to happen in act six we got to understand what's been going on in this brand new church that we call the kingdom so in acts one we see that the the disciples they're all sitting in the upper room they're waiting upon the spirit there's 120 of them so there's the 12 that were the original that Jesus had called to them and they they had followed Jesus for three years but over that time 120 was now this group in Acts 1 and Acts 2 Peter stands up as he has the Holy Spirit on him he begins to preach this message and the crowd says what must we do to be saved And he replies, repent, be baptized. And in that first day of church service, 3,000 people were added. So do the addition. It's 3,000 plus 120. We have 3,120 people in this brand new church. The church was a mega church from day one. And then we see in Acts 4 that it grows to the point to now that it says there's 5,000 men. Now, what that means is that they got so big that they couldn't even count the total number of people. They were just counting households now. There was 5,000 households in the church, and they were just multiplying, and they were going out. So we, got, we started from 120. We're now at 3,000. Now we're at 5,000. So that's in Acts 4. Now in Acts 5, uh, Jeremy, you mind turn me down just a little bit? There's, I don't know if you can hear it from back there, but th- there we go. Perfect. Um, in Acts 5, what we uh, heard from Steve last week, that there's this issue that was going on, that Satan was on the attack because God's church was blowing up. I mean, it was doing amazing things. Ananias and Sapphira, we, we hear the story, and it's honestly, it's a, it's a chapter of the Bible that we tend to skim over, and we don't understand it. And so we tend to just kind of pass it a lot of times. But there's one key verse that I think helps me understand this, this part of Ananias and Sapphira, and it's where Satan enters the scene. It says in Acts 5, 3, it says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart and lied to the Holy Spirit? And that's why they ended up dead. Yet because of this scene... God's church continues to grow. In Acts 5.14, it says, More than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. At this point, the church is just growing, and there's just multitudes. They're not even counting anymore. They're not even like 5,000 men. They're just like, they're just coming. Like, we don't even know at this point. There's just so many people. The multitudes are just coming. And this makes Satan mad, and he tends to get jealous, and he makes the, the high priest very jealous at the end of this scene. And we see, uh, if you don't know who the high priest is, the high priest was, uh, he was over the Jewish synagogue or the temple there at that time. And he was the highest ranking uh, person basically amongst all the Jewish people. And he was filled with jealousy is what we're told him and all of his friends that were around him. And so what do they go and do? They go and they arrest the apostles. They go out into the street where, where Peter and the rest of the apostles were preaching and they arrest them. And they throw them into prison. And this is something that we didn't get to see last week just because there is so much in God's word that is so deep and so incredible that as Steve, even though he was given five weeks to preach on five chapters, he had to skip over some of the stuff. And this is just one of those amazing stories where God sends an angel to break them out of prison. Now, you know, most of you know that I worked in a prison. If I saw an angel break someone out, I don't know what I would do. Like, do I stop this? Do I not stop this? What's going on here? I'm kind of caught here. Um, But that's what happens. God sends an angel and he breaks them out. And what do they do? 
The apostles go back to the same exact spot that they were caught preaching at before. And they just keep on teaching and preaching. And so what does the high priest and all his friends do? They go and they bring them back in. They send them before the council, before these many men, and they, they rebuke them. They're, they're telling them, hey, you've got to quit teaching about this Jesus. And to prove our point, we're going to beat you. And when it says they're going to beat you, that, that was severe. That wasn't just a punch or a swing or two. This was a long process. They were basically tortured. And we're going to pick up in Acts 5.41 what the apostles did because they were just beaten. It says, Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. And so that's what happens in God's unstoppable church. You, you beat us, we're going to go out and we're going to preach not just once a week now. We're going to preach every single day. We're not just going to preach out on the street. We're going to go to the temple where you are and we're actually going to preach in your courtyards and we're going to go house to house to make sure every single person knows about this. That's what God's unstoppable church is all about. And so we're going to go into Acts 6 now, and this is where I get to pick up. Now, I want you to realize this, though, that whenever Luke was writing this original letter, he didn't stop and put in chapter 6 here. It just kept flowing. And so we're supposed to pick up here in Acts 6 about how Ananias and Sapphira, how they how they died because they lied to the Holy Spirit, yet because of that, the church kept growing, and then their, the apostles were thrown into prison, yet because of that, the church kept growing. And so we're to pick this up here in Acts 6.1. So if you wouldn't mind, stand with me, and we're going to read through Acts 6.1. We're going to go to verse 7. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of the faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you this morning. Thank you for your word. Father, I want to thank you for your son, Jesus, that all of us gather here this morning and we've, we've worshiped you, that we've lifted your name up, that, Father, we've taken communion together to remember you and your name, that, Father, as we come now and we, we want to learn from you. So, Father, I know my difficulties in preaching your word. So, Father, I pray that you just work through me because if, if it's going to come from me, I'm going to stutter, stumble. And I'm going to fall flat. So, Father, I pray that you use me, use the studies that I've had in the scripture, that, Father, use my experiences, use every part of me to be able to teach your word this morning, because if anyone's heart is pierced, if their minds are changed, if their life is set on a new course to follow you, Father, it's going to have to come from you and not from me. So, Father, I pray for that this morning. Father, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May we see you. So in Acts 6.1, we get this issue that's, that's starting to arise in the church. Yet our series that we're talking about is called The Unstoppable Church. And we've seen this kind of already happen throughout Acts 5, that Satan goes on the attack. And yet when Satan goes on the attack, it sure seems like God's church just explodes. It just gets bigger, right? Well, you and I, whenever we look in our context, when we look here in modern America 2021, but not just modern America, let's go to Madison and Rush and Henry and Hancock County. You and I, we, we probably know churches that we either drive past or we know people, or maybe there's even some here today that were a part of a church that closed their doors for the very last time in the past two years. And so when we say God's church is unstoppable, some of us might think, what's... Like, I hear that, but I, I see something differently. 
And I think it's important for us to relate that a local congregation is just a part of the local church, the capital C church that's growing worldwide because Cram, one of the missionaries that we're supporting now, what they are doing over there in Asia, the church is exploding. And by the day, thousands are coming to know the Lord Jesus, just like we see here. But here's something that you and I, we should take a note out of because we are in a part of the world where the church is under attack and in different ways it is under the attack. And Satan, he's sly. He likes to get in and he's not going to attack in the ways that maybe he attacked in the first century. He's going to get in in other ways. And so I think it's important that you and I, when we look at this scripture, that we find out how we become a healthy church. And that's your first note there if you have your bulletin. It's the early church will show us what to expect when we become a healthy church. Because if you and I, if, if we try to become a healthy church, as a church body, there's, there's going to be Satan that is going to attack. And your second slide on there is a healthy church is going to have problems because Satan will attack us. Now, when we read the first verse here, you and I, we probably read that and we read, well, there's this group called the Hellenists or whatever it might be called. And your version might be called the Greek speaking widows. And then there's the Hebrews and then there's daily distribution of food. And well, that stinks because they didn't get their food. Well, you and I, whenever we think about food distribution, we don't normally say that. We say we're going to go shopping for food or something. Whenever you and I, when we think about that, we tend to think in terms of weeks, So whenever Rebecca goes to buy groceries for us, she might go buy a week's worth or two weeks worth. But whenever we look at this situation, this was a daily thing. They were going daily to get it. And the thing is, whenever you and I, whenever we place ourselves in that context, we also must place in the context that if they don't get food one day, that they don't have a week or two's worth of supply already back in their pantry, just full of things that you just don't want to eat, like pinto beans or something like that. Things that just tend to collect dust. But if we, for whatever reason, that the local Dollar General or Walmart or Kroger or wherever it was just stopped giving us food, we could probably survive for some amount of time. And so we can't do that whenever we look at this text because that's not what's going on. God's word. You start in the very beginning and you go through the very end. Through Genesis, through Revelation, there is three common themes of, and three common groups of people that God tends to have a huge heart for. And that is the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans. And here from the very beginning of this text, we see that the church is under attack under two of those. That we have these Greek speaking, there are foreigners that are being neglected and there are widows that are being neglected daily and what that neglected daily means is that they were not getting any food that day there were starving widows in the first church that they were purposely being neglected and it wasn't just like they could go to their cupboard and eat their pinto beans that they haven't eaten in three months they didn't have anything this was a huge issue More than likely, there was these widows that were dying because there was racism, because they were Hellenists. They they spoke Greek instead of speaking what the Hebrews thought that they should be speaking. Like, this is a huge issue. And you and I, whenever we read this, like, it's so easy to, to pass right through this, right? But really, this is a huge, huge issue. Racism and starving widows happening in the first century church. And this was brought to the attention of the apostles. Now, you and I, I think we kind of, we, we kind of do this, maybe not with starving widows, at least I hope none of us do that. But I think that you and I, whenever we, we come to this passage, I think that you and I probably do something very similar. Because what was happening is whenever they were passing out the food daily, they went to who they knew. They probably ran out and just didn't give it to who they didn't know. So whenever the, the Hebrews, the Hebrew Christians at this point, whenever they're passing out their food, well, I know this widow, so I'm going to go give them this amount of food. Because what was happening, if you remember back in Acts 5.42, what we just read, whenever the, the apostles, they were going and they were preaching and teaching from house to house and in the temple courts, Dr. Gary Johnson says that it was very common whenever you preach from house to house that they would take a basket with them and say, hey, any leftovers that you have today, I'll take, and I'm going to take them to the widows. And they were being passed out to the widows, but they were only Hebrew-speaking widows. And the the Greek-speaking widows, they weren't getting any food, so they were starving literally to death. And this is this huge issue. So I think that you and I, whenever we look at it from that standpoint, I think that we kind of bring ourselves into this. Because more than likely, when you go out and buy Christmas, you're going to buy primarily for your kids, right? You're not buying for my kids. You might know them, 
You might see them, but you're not buying for my kids. We, we tend to take care of our own a little bit more. And that, that's just a, a small example. Um, a few were actually last weekend. You might not know this, but in this room, there was about 350, maybe even more than that, uh, mostly high school and middle school students that were in this room. And, and Silas and I, we ran uh, this event and we got really creative with the name and we called it The Event that is what we called that. So um, yeah, that's our creativity coming out in this. And we, we changed up the stage, we made it go long ways, and like there was chairs on the side, and it was just great time. Um, really well-known speaker, at least amongst like the high school groups, Taylor Brown, we had him come. Uh, Heart and Mind Worship did a fantastic job. Well, then there was this other guy, his name's YB, who's become a good friend of Rebecca and, and I and his wife, and I absolutely love them. Well, the students love him, and it, he's a Christian rapper, and so you might not care for Christian rap or rap in general, but what this man does in between each song and how he explains and how he draws in the students, that's why we love him. That's why the students, like they will be up on the stage right next to it, jumping around, not because of his actual songs, but because of his heart. And so when Silas and I, we were humbly uh, setting up the the chairs and we were setting up the, where people were going to sit, and we put our group in the very back for most of the, the time, the first three sessions, because there was four. We decided, you know, last session, you know, we haven't been up front, so let's, let's put our kids up front. Well, that just happens to be when the YB concert was, right? And so we take care of our own in certain ways. We, we tend to always care for our own more than what we care for others. And that's what was going on here. But this was on a horrible and massive scale that there were dying widows because they were being starved to death. And that sounds horrible. And I think that you and I as a church, that we might be in a similar situation. Because what we just showed on the screen were orphans that need homes. There are foster care kids that need homes. And that yet there are no people to take care of them, yet we see rooms full of people that have homes to take care of them. And if I was to say, if, if Jesse, our children's minister, was to bring up here a child from the back, and for whatever circumstance it might be, and to bring up here on stage with me and say, hey, this child has no home. Something just happened to their parents. She can't go home. She has no home anymore. Like, she needs a new family. I guarantee I wouldn't go past two or three rows, and somebody would say, I will take her. I will take her in. Even if you don't know her, if you, even if you didn't know her, her parents, but by extension of the church, you feel like you know her and you feel like there's a responsibility. Yet there's this disconnect whenever we see kids on the screen or we pass by a sign that says foster parents needed. And that's what was going on in the first century. There was widows that were dying, being neglected of food. And we don't have that now, but we have orphans that don't have a home. And we're going to see how the apostles, how they, how they fixed this issue. In verse number two, they recognize the issue. In verse number two, it says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect preaching the word of God to serve tables. And I'll be honest, whenever I come to this passage, the more and more I studied it, the, the more I became, you know, just a little bit conflicted in myself with what the apostles were doing. Because let me just use the scenario of using the child to come up here that's now a foster child and needs a home. I promise you that if, that if I was charged with either preaching this morning or if I could go and take care of a widow that wasn't being fed or an orphan that was here that was starving, I guarantee I'd be a few minutes late up here to the stage because I'd be taking care of that person. You know, when there's this group of people, this group of widows that were dying because they were starving... The apostle said, it is not right for us to go take care of them, is what they were saying. But instead, we must preach and teach God's word instead. We shouldn't go serve tables. And to be honest, I had this conflict within myself because we know that God teaches us to go and to serve the foreigners and the widows and the orphans. And so I'm, I looked at this passage and I was thinking, what are the apostles thinking? Are they, are they kind of prideful or are they like, I'm, I, you know, I'm in this position, like I don't need to go take care of that? So I started to reflect on what Jesus' words were. And what I've come to realize is that if I come to a part in the Bible, even a verse like this, and I'm conflicted and I don't agree with it, I got to realize that it's not God's word that's wrong. 
It's my thoughts, it's my feelings that are wrong in this. And so when I reflected back on what Jesus had done and what he had said, when he spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting and praying in the wilderness, who came on the scene? Satan. So Jesus, who was literally in a bodily form, he was starving, comes on the scene, he is tempted. And what is Jesus' words? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that comes out of God's mouth. You see, you and I, we, we tend to look at the issues around us, and we look at horrible issues, issues that are on God's heart, like taking care of widows and orphans. And yet what the apostles were teaching is that, yes, these are issues, and they are very real issues, and we are not suppressing them, we're not putting them down, but we're saying what we're saying is that God's word is even above that. And honestly, like I struggled with that, but then I got to realize from God's point of view is that the word of God is what's going to save people's lives, not food in their belly. And so if they don't get the word of God first and foremost, and that's the most important thing, then there's never going to be a chance for God to live with them in eternity. And the apostles are teaching them this, but the apostles aren't putting it aside. They're saying, listen, this is an issue. We need to preach and we need to teach. And so they're going to go on to verse number three here because we start to see how the healthy church will organize itself to continue on mission. And that's our next slide. Verse number three says this, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So the apostles, they, they recognize the issue. They know what's going on. And they say, listen, we, we need to take care of, of this issue. We know that. So we're going to appoint seven men full of good reputation that's full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. This past week, and uh, even right now, uh, we are still collecting items for some students in our areas from our local schools that you know, have some kids that won't have Christmas. And I could have taken our church budget and I could have went shopping and got all these kids Christmas and got them, you know, things that they wanted or needed more than anything. Yet I put this call out on Monday, and some of you may have seen it or may have even took part of this. I put this call out and just saying, hey, there's a group of kids that just need help. And it was just kind of an informal, I just talked with the schools, these are some of the things we need. And with less than 24 hours, our church, this group of people, took care of every single item on that list so much that we had more people that were wanting to help than what we did students that needed help. And that's how God's church works, right? I could have went and did all this myself, yet it would, have taken, it would have taken some time away from me to go do other things that I could have been preaching and teaching. And our church took care of this issue. And that's how God's kingdom works. See, a healthy church, it will continue to organize itself, to be on mission. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Greek here. Um, so, Allison, if you wouldn't mind, put this slide up here. So, whenever it says uh, that the apostles called him out and says, choose from among you or pick out from among you seven men of good reputation, of wisdom, of the Holy Spirit, it's this word right here. Now, I don't know if anybody can really pronounce this, um, but it, it's a pretty tough word. But I will say that as we go to the translations that we have, that word choose is oftentimes, actually every other time, it's mentioned in the Bible, instead of choose, it's to visit, or to see, or to inspect. And so what the apostles were doing, they were gathering these, this group of people, and they, they gathered them all together, more than likely what we know from church history, they gathered, and I, they kind of stood up on a stage like this, probably in the temple courts, and they had the, it says, the full number of disciples. It said, choose from among you, or inspect from among you seven men full of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. Now, who is it, if I was to list off to you, who would that person be? More than likely, someone popped in your head. Maybe two guys popped in your head. Well, what the apostles, what they were saying is, let us inspect you. Let us see your good deeds. Let us see how you are full of the Holy Spirit. Do you have a good reputation amongst this group right here? And we're going to pick seven men amongst you. And do you see this list that, that the qualifications were? A good reputation. More than likely, most of you know a lot of men with a good reputation. Most of you know a lot of men that have made mostly wise choices in their life. And most of you know Christian men that are full of the Holy Spirit. So that list that they had given, it wasn't this super strict list that says you need a master's degree in divinity. 
It wasn't this list that says you need 20 years worth of experience to go take care of this issue. Whenever the, the apostles, whenever they first started to organize themselves, they didn't have this strenuous list. They had, we need some good men. We need men that will step up and take care of the issue. Can you take care of a starving widow? Yes. Are you full of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do you have wisdom? Yes. Do you have a good reputation? Let me inspect. Let's see. Let's ask some people. Yes. Stephen, you're going to be our guy. And that's how they chose the first set of organization that was going on. This list goes on, or I'm sorry, this verse goes on in Acts 6, number 4. It says this. It says, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the apostles, they are, again, they are saying, we are going to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And I think you and I, we should take a note from this because we begin to realize that prayer and the study of God's word is one of the most important things that you and I can do in serving, helping widows, helping orphans is an outflow directly from that. And we understand, uh, I know this from the small groups that I'm in and just talking with men in general, that whenever we come to faith, it is almost like we are expected to know how to pray. Yet I've sat in many groups of men that will run into a house that is on fire to save some children, yet they will not pray in front of a group of men because no one's ever taught them how to pray. And so our prayer ministry team, they put this card together. If you don't have it, there's some laying on the back desk, but it should be in your bulletin. And it's going to teach you how to pray. And throughout this next week, the prayer ministry team is asking that you and I pray every single day that God will send us a lead minister, someone to help teach and preach the word of God alongside of the elders here. Someone that will come and that will lead in our congregation and the ministry team, they are asking that you and I, we, we are guided by this prayer. In Matthew 7, 7, it says this, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find it, knock and the door will be open. So that every day when you and I, I hope that every single one of you do this, that you pray every single day this week that we are knocking, Father, give us, send us somebody. Father, prepare that man for us. Father, we're asking that you give wisdom to our elders. The guiding prayer for this has been Matthew 9.38. It says, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers into his harvest. So what, that's our guiding prayer that the Father will send us somebody to be the, the laborer, to be the person that goes out and to be able to gather the harvest that is all around us to help and to guide us with that. So because it's Matthew 9.38, we're asking that you set an alarm on your phone for 9.38, whether it's a.m. or p.m. or both, and that we will pray together at 9.38 every single day this next week, specifically for our elders and for the new lead minister that is to come. So the apostles, they were devoting themselves to prayer, and they were also devoting themselves to the ministry of the word. So what does that even mean, the ministry of the word? Because honestly, that sounds kind of confusing. We tend to think that it's preaching out of this Bible, but we got to note that they didn't have a Bible like this. As, actually, as a matter of fact, everything that is on the right hasn't been done yet. It hasn't been written. So what is the ministry of the word? Well, the word to the apostles, it was the teachings of Jesus. It was the words that came out of Jesus' mouth. It's what came out of God's mouth in the very beginning. Because when God spoke, in the very beginning of time, when he spoke, the universe exploded out. And what's amazing is that science will affirm this, that the universe continues to grow from one focal point, that everything is shooting out from that point. God spoke, the universe became, it was his word that was powerful. It's his word that gave us life physically and spiritually. And so the ministry of the word is what gives us life in this. And they had to continue on mission. Many of you know, I worked in a prison for a time and um, there was this one scenario. Um, I was, uh, we were going up to a dorm in a dorm setting. It's, it was a room about this size and there was approximately 150 to 170 men in this room that are full of Indiana's worst. And it was all open. It wasn't in cells, uh, a lot like the rest of the prison. This is one big open dorm setting. And on the cell extraction team, or this particular team, it was a dorm extraction team, it's a lot tougher because you're not just going in 
for one person, you're going in and there's 170 people. Where I was heading was kind of like back where the restrooms were. I mean, I had, we had to travel through the entire thing. We didn't know what was going on. They damaged the cameras and there was something going on back in that area and we had to get to them. So it's me and it's four other men and each of us have this very specific assigned duty and I was typically on the, the front. Uh, so I held like the shield and my objective was to get from point A to point B. Don't be distracted if something gets in the way that I just kind of go right through it. That was my job. I had to get to that point. Second person and they would put their left hand on my belt loop right behind me and they would focus everything on the right. Third person had their right hand on that person's belt loop and they would focus everything on the left. Fourth person, they would go in and they would kind of scan looking at everything and up in case there was anything up above. The last person in actually walked backwards like this. So that 360 degrees was covered by our sight. And if something happened on our right side, the person that was facing left could not look until our team leader said go. Because if he looked... And something was to come from behind us. And if he was distracted by some other part of what was going on inside of that dorm, lives could be lost. All of our lives could have been lost in that moment. And that's exactly what the apostles, what they were doing. They're saying, listen, we, we have an objective. Jesus, our Lord, our Christ, our King has given us an objective that we are to preach and to teach God's words because that is what's going to save people's lives. And if we do anything else, lives will be lost. And so we need men. We need seven good men to come up behind us and to help us out with this issue. And that's what's going on. We're going to read verses five through seven. We're going to see that a healthy church will serve as a whole. It says, <clears throat> and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Procurus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of priests became obedient to the faith. So we see here that whenever we start to serve, whenever we start to serve those needs around us, these men that were chosen to take care of the widows, they were chosen for a very specific task in this time, that the church will begin to explode. Yet we know that through Jesus' teachings, through his actions, that each and every single one of us are here to serve. That there is not a single person that calls himself a follower of Jesus should ever be idle and not serving some way in the church. But there was these group of men that were set apart. Some will say that they were anointed, their hands were laid on them. They were set aside for a very specific task. Yet we know that each and every single one of us should be serving at all times. And the last point, worship team, you can come on up, is a healthy church will raise up new leaders. And we see this through Stephen, who was just chosen to take care of the issue of the widows. In verse 8, it says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those of Sicily and Asia, they rose up and disputed with Stephen. So you had Stephen who, was, who stepped out to serve and he grew in that. And yet he had some people arguing with him and it says this in verse 10, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. I know that many of us in this room are, are serving and serving wholeheartedly, but I also know that there are some that maybe should take another step out and begin to serve a little bit more because God will do amazing things when you begin to serve, not just in your life, but in the lives around you. And especially whenever you care for what God cares for, the foreigners, the widows, the orphans, God will do amazing things. Rebecca and I, we sat in a seat out here about nine years ago, and we went to something that was similar to what our connection is. And our children's minister at that time, he, he didn't really even know us. He kind of knew of us. He knew our reputation a little bit, knew that we were believers. And he said, you want to help out with the children's ministry? Becca said yes, so I had to say yes also. <laughs> and he asked, when do we start? And he looked at his watch and he said, about two hours from now. And so we jumped in. And that's how Rebecca and I got started here. About a year and a half later, he called us into full-time ministry. And then God has continued 
And I want to put this emphasis, God has continued to do amazing things around Rebecca and I's life that we are so privileged to be a part of. But we had to take that first step and to step out and to serve for the very first time to see what God was doing around us. Because if you want to have a closer relationship with Jesus, yes, be in study and in prayer, but serve where his heart is as well. And you will see Jesus. Again, thank you for tuning in to this week's online message. We hope you feel encouraged and empowered and are ready to take on this week with love and with grace. Have a wonderful week, Wilkinson.